Dobry wieczór Państwu. Bardzo miło przywitać Państwa na głównym wydarzeniu trzeciej edycji w serii Wielkie Pytania w Krakowie, czyli serii organizowanej przez Fundację Centrum Kopernika, Uniwersytet Jagielloński, współfinansowanej ze środków miasta. We look at the great questions that humanity has asked since the earliest days of the species, the questions that have inspired the great authors, the great people of culture. May I welcome all of you who have gathered here and all those who watch us live on Copernicus Center YouTube channel. The great questions are usually a range of questions. Yesterday we had a discussion with John Dylan Haynes, whom we welcome very cordially, a discussion with Professor Bartosz Brożek. The recording of that debate will soon be available at Copernicus Center YouTube channel. This edition is also accompanied by the works of Dr. Kinga Nowak, an artist from the Department of Painting of the Academy of Fine Arts in Kraków. Welcome. We're using Kinga's works in our promotional materials and you could also see a handful of those before entering this room. As we are starting Professor Haynes' lecture in a moment, uh, and it's going to be uh, delivered in English, please uh, put on your headset and this will be your opportunity to hear whether everything works fine. Welcome Professor John Dylan Hines, world leading neuroscientist, the special guest uh, of the third edition of the Big Questions in Kraków series. Uh, Professor Hines kindly accepted our invitation. Uh, it's unclear whether he had a choice since it's unknown whether human being possess a uh, free will, but I'm sure that I don't need any, uh, any special ability to read your minds to see that uh, we all hear uh, came to the same conclusion. The conclusion uh, that the only person who can face the problem of free will and the problem of mind reading from the neuroscientific perspective is Professor Heinz. Professor, the floor is yours. So, uh, good evening everyone. and. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to be in Krakow again. I keep telling people that I was in Krakow 18 years ago and it still is as beautiful as I remembered it. So you're all very lucky that you can live in this beautiful city and uh, that you can, uh, that you're blessed with such a fascinating interdisciplinary institute as the Copernicus Center. So thanks to uh, the organizers for the invitation to come here to Krakow. Now I'm gonna talk about free will and mind reading and um, I'm going to try and give you an idea of what brain science can contribute to the problems of free will uh, and mind reading. And before we even start, I'd like to say that I'm not trying to sell something here. What I want to do is I want to give you an idea of what neuroscience can and can't do. I think it's very important when we engage in interdisciplinary debates for example, between neuroscience, psychology, philosophy, theology, law, etc., we're very clear about what can and what can't be done. And um, so um, we also need to kind of go step outside of the comfort zone of our individual disciplines and engage in debate. And of course, we'll have different opinions on things. And I'm, I welcome these debates. So I'm, I'm very happy and looking forward to a debate we can have later as well. So let me jump right in. So um, what do I mean when I say free will? Um, it's very contentious, and there's been debates about this for two and a half thousand years. Um, but what I mean is something like this. First of all, I mean the subjective experience that we have when we make a decision. Like this one here. Say you're coming to a crossing, and there's a left path and a right path. And at this point in time, people have the impression that they can choose left and right, and that it's not predetermined by their brain activity which choice they have to make. They somehow feel that it's not decided yet if they're going to take one or the other option. 
And in neuroscience and even physics might say, well, it seems from our knowledge of the kind of quasi-deterministic universe, that it should be decided by our brain states that we're going to take left or right. But the, 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 what I mean here with free will is a subjective experience of this person that we, when we come to these decision points, we don't feel constrained. We don't feel that the forces of the universe, the physics and the physiology, make us take one or the other option. Now, there are situations where our freedom can be constrained um, uh, using um, external constraints. For example, if we uh, have one of these roads were to have a wall and the route would be blocked, then we'd feel that that's an impediment to our free um, will because we can't enact what we've freely chosen to do. So if there was a wall blocking the path to the right, we'd feel somehow um, I inhibited. But um, that's an external constraint on our freedom. I'm not talking about these external constraints on our freedom. If anything, I'm going to be talking about the internal constraints in our freedom. Uh, so constraints that come from within our brain or within our mind. Now, people tend to have the impression that they can do otherwise. And the way we know this, when I say people have this impression, often this is a throwaway statement that people make. Oh yes, my intuition says, we all know that, and so on. These kind of statements, yeah? Like, we appeal to our ideas about what people think, but actually, we and others have now started to measure what people think when we make these decisions. And um, you ask questions like these to large cohorts of people, you say things like, People always have the ability to do otherwise. And if I were to ask this question, I realize it's not a very precise question, but let's just say, um, if you were to take it by face value, how would you answer to this question? Would you, so if you say, yes, please raise your hand now, and I'm expecting you to raise your hand either for the yes, the don't know, or the no. So uh, we should, um, everyone should raise their hand at least once. And only once, actually. So um, let's hear everyone who says, People always have the ability to do otherwise. Yes. Who? So um, that's a small proportion, I'd say. Who says don't know? Another kind of intermediate proportion. And who says no? I'd say another intermediate proportion. So I'd say you're split between these three different alternatives, but you're not a representative sample. Um, I have to say, if you ask this question to many people, you go and do a representative survey. We've done this in the US and Singapore and in Germany. And what comes out of that is people overwhelmingly believe in free will. So if there's, a, there's a, um, uh, an instrument for this, it's called the free will inventory developed by Nadelhofer and colleagues. And it gives you a scale, a measurement scale for people's beliefs in free will. And what you can see here in, in the right is a, is a plot. If you're to the right on this scale, you believe in free will. If you're in the middle with a dotted line, you are kind of undecided. If you're to the left, you don't believe in free will. And you can see overwhelmingly people seem to believe that we have free will. So it's not something that I'm just making up. People feel freedom when they come to these kind of crossing points. And I mentioned this as well. So when you come to a crossing point and there's an impediment, that's kind of an external constraint of behavior. We're not going to be talking about that here today, just about internal constraints. So why does neuroscience play a role here? What does neuroscience have to add? The challenge is um, that we'd say, if it is fully determined which choice we're going to make based on our brain signals, then it should be clear whether we're going to take the left or the right option based on simply the causal nature of our universe. So this is something that you could derive from physics, and the kind of answer that you have, the ideas of the determination, uh, uh, deterministic principles of causation uh, in uh, uh, the kind of basic physics would be what kind of makes you constrained in the sense that when you come to this crossing point, it's almost like pre-programmed by the laws of nature which choice you're going to take. Now, why does neuroscience come in here? I think it comes in because if you have a textbook that says, yes, the laws of nature are deterministic or stochastic at a microscopic level, uh, you know this from your physics textbook, you might say, yeah, 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 my physics textbook, that was in high school and I've long forgotten that. And, um, but I know in my day-to-day -day life, I think people have free choices, as you see most people believe. 
I think it just it's not strong enough, this physical uh, um, approach, it's not strong enough to persuade people to believe that their choices might be more determined than they think. So I think neuroscience can add to this, and we'll come to investigate whether this is kind of warranted, it can add to this possibly a more convincing demonstration that we are um, constrained by our brain in the choices that we make. Now, this goes back, research in this field goes back to these guys here, Kornhuber and Decker, who in the 1960s studied spontaneous movements. So people in this case, they could, at some point that they freely wanted to, just raise a hand or press a button, flex a wrist. They did these kind of motor experiments. And what they found was just before you make the movement, that there is a slow buildup of the brain. So it's not that when you spontaneously decide, so the opposite of this is a reactive decision. So basically, I give you a green light, and then you're supposed to press the button immediately. But in these self-paced decisions, it seems that over a period of a second or so, this builds up gradually in the brain. Um, and that's called the readiness potential, or Breitschaft's potential in Germany, as it was originally called. So this, there's this preparation of a decision when it's self-paced, when you don't know, um, you don't have anything externally constraining when you're going to make a decision. And along came, many years later, uh, Benjamin Libet, who was an American uh, uh, neuroscientist, um, and he studied the readiness potential, but he wanted to know the following simple question. He wanted to know, when do people decide which choice they're going to make? So, for example, w that they're going to move now versus they're going to move later. So when do people make up their mind about their movements? And he um, did this using an experiment that you can criticize in several ways, uh, but it's a heroic first experiment. He measured the EEG again, and he measured when people decided using a quite clever technique. He had a ball that was uh, on a computer screen, and it was rotating once every two and a half seconds, so it's slowly rotating. And people were asked to make decisions spontaneously move their, uh, flex their wrist, for example, to make a movement, and to me remember where the ball was on the screen when they made up their mind. And what they found, what they found was that, what well, you can see here at the bottom, is that's the readiness potential. The readiness potential seems to deviate from baseline about half a second before you actually move. So the action is zero milliseconds. That's the peak of this curve here. But W is the time when people think they're deciding. And what he found was the people seem to be deciding around 200 milliseconds before the movement, but about 300 milliseconds after the onset of the brain signal. So when you're deciding, you feel, I'm deciding now, the brain has already started doing something two, 300 milliseconds before which seems strange, because if I'm free to move or not to move, how could my brain have known that I was going to move in 200 or 300 milliseconds? How could the brain have known that? And a typical interpretation of these results is the following. They go like this. So you'd say, OK, um, we tend to think this is how we make our decisions. So first we make up our mind in some mind space. Then our mind space does something with our body, and our body sets sorry, with the brain, and then the brain sets the body in motion. That's how we intuitively think about our decisions. And on the left, it's like a thought bubble, because I would claim that most people think when they make decisions that this is purely in their mind space, and they tend to have the intuition this has got nothing to do with their brain, or it's secret from their brain, and there's no way to tell this. There's like a little secret escape place in your, your mind that's got nothing to do with the physical universe. That's very similar to what René Descartes um, uh, posited, which he called the res cogitans, the thinking substance, as opposed to the bodily processes, which are the res extensa, the extended substance. And what these experiments suggest is it's actually quite different. It's not triggered by your mind, the starting point of a decision, but actually some unconscious brain process starts. This then causes your decision, your conscious decision, and this conscious decision is also realized by the brain, it's some brain process, and then you put the body in motion. And this is a fundamental difference. If you are the ultimate cause of your actions, your conscious mind versus it's your brain and your conscious decision is just kind of something that's dangling uh, on after a causal process in your brain that is fully constrained possibly by the brain processes. 
I'd like to say that um, this is the standard kind of hand-waving interpretation of the Libet experiments. I'm not sure, and then we're going to look at this in close scrutiny, whether the Libet experiments really deliver in uh, uh, um, substantiating this claim. So we looked at this a few years later using MRI instead of EG. MRI has an advantage, functional magnetic resonance imaging. It gives us a better resolution of the brain process and we can look all over the brain. So we did the following experiment. People made decisions between pressing a left and a right button and they um, were asked to do this spontaneously whenever they felt the urge to press a button to immediately press the corresponding button. And we also asked them to remember which letter was on the screen when they made up their mind. So there was a sequence of random consonants. And people were asked to remember which consonant was on the screen when they made up their mind. So they're not supposed to wait until the letter Z and then make up their mind. But to um, remember that the Z happened to be on the screen when they made up their mind. And now what we have again is the following. We've got the time when you move. We've got the time when you make up your mind. And now we can look at the predictive relationship between these. And just as a reminder, functional magnetic resonance imaging is a technique. It doesn't give us access to neural activity in itself. So I always think it's best to be very upfront about the limitations of your techniques. And magnetic resonance imaging is a fantastic technique. And functional magnetic resonance imaging gives us the ability to measure brain activity in the broadest sense. But it reflects magnetic changes in blood depending on whether it binds oxygen or not. So oxygenated hemoglobin is non-magnetic and non-oxygenated hemoglobin that isn't carrying uh, uh, oxygen anymore um, is magnetic. And that's something that we can measure with this technique. So this technique is ultimately limited by the vasculature. We're measuring a property of the blood supply. We're not measuring a property of individual neurons. And there is a biological limitation here. It's something that's not easy to overcome by just building better or stronger field brain scanners. So that's just uh, important. And the second thing in the bottom right, you can see a brain image obtained while people were looking at um, uh, object stimuli. Um, these maps show you regions where the brain is more active or less active. So the more active regions are in hot colors and the cold regions are where the brain is less active. But these are statistical maps. It's not a photograph. Uh, this is a statistical map, and that just means that this states that there's a probability or a high likelihood that there is something happening in the brain there. So people sometimes in the public tend to kind of, there's a little bit of a distortion here when this gets simplified, that this is like a picture that is absolute ground truth. It tells you something about a probability, a very high probability, but still it's just a probability. So now the way we look at the brain signals is that we uh, look at the information contained in these brain signals and the spatial structure of these brain signals using what's called brain classifiers. And I'm not going to go into detail about this, but ultimately this is the same approach that you use when you want to, um, for example, detect a face um, on Facebook or you want to detect a fingerprint. It's a very similar approach. You look at the spatial structure of the face or the spatial structure of the fingerprint and you train your computer to recognize a face based on lots of examples of a person's face or lots of examples of a face's fingerprints if you want to uh, recognize fingerprints. And then a computer, a machine learning algorithm as it's called, a classifier, can learn to recognize these, um, uh, 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 this structure. And we can do the same for the brain. So now we're going to train the brain classifier to say, well, this is a brain signal while a person was just about to choose left, and this is a brain signal while a person was just about to choose right. Can you, classifier, tell the difference between these two brain states? And if yes, we have information about which choice you're going to make. So that will only work if the brain signal, the pattern of brain activity, is different in the lead up to the decision between the choices for left and right. Uh, and um, that's exactly what we find. So if we look in the brain, what we find is uh, two regions, frontal polar cortex, that's at the top. So if you look at the center image, that's a slice through the brain. The top of this is the frontal polar cortex, which is a region in your frontal cortex, which has to do with high level action planning. And in your parietal cortex, that's the kind of lower green region. They have information about your decision. So what you can see on the x-axis here is time, and you can see the red vertical line is the time point when you think you're making up your mind. 
and the line shows you the information and if there is no information, the classifier is a chance level, there is no information there, it's just randomly guessing, then you're on the kind of uh, v uh, the horizontal line that, w that is uh, indicated with 50%. But what you can see is in the lead up to the decision, even before you think you're making up their mind, there is information about your choice and the funny thing is, this information seems to be there up to seven seconds before you think you're making up your mind. Seven seconds, that's a long time. So let's just go for seven seconds. I'm going to say from now to now. That's a long time. Um, so another thing you can notice is that the prediction classification accuracy is not that high. It's around 50 to 5 to 60 percent. This is significant, so statistically this is okay, but because we've got many repetitions, we can be sure of this, but nonetheless we can't predict perfectly, and I'm going to come to that later. So the first question we can say is, well, how can it be that there is this information seven seconds before we make up our mind? How is that even possible? Because I know when I cycle on my bike in Berlin, um, I'm constantly face, uh, faced with the situation that a taxi or someone else just kind of drives in my lane and I, have to, I can't wait seven seconds to respond. We know that we can respond faster. Well, this is a very different kind of decision. The decision here is a self-paced decision. You can make up your mind when you want. You're not forced to do this at a particular time. And so these self-paced decisions are very different than reactive decisions where you're forced to respond as fast as you possibly can. So it's a very different type of decision. And think about when you're deciding uh, whether you want to study uh, psychology or neuroscience, or if you want to study in Krakow or in Warsaw or something like that. We know that decisions can build up over long periods of time. It's nothing surprising when there's no external constraint that we can do this across even longer periods of time. Another question is, is long-term prediction of choice outcomes surprising? Is it, isn't this really weird? Seven seconds? In fact, I'd say no. If I were to ask you, if you like coffee or tea, and uh, you might say coffee, I'm pretty sure I would have been able to predict your choice from the same question asked to you five years ago. You might have said coffee five years ago. I could predict with pretty high accuracy your choice now. Or we know that brand preferences, for example, in this case for consumer items, are pretty stable across time. So we, for example, might have policies, we have standards, we have routines with which we deal with things. So the fact that we can predict choice outcomes across long periods of time is not surprising at all. It's actually something that we would completely expect. So now, when you look at these um, a little bit experiments, you can say, yeah, that's all good. Even, let's just say I buy the fact that there is this preparatory brain signal and that you can predict the outcome of a decision. But, you know, I really don't think that these Libet experiments capture the essence of free will, what free will really is. Yeah? That's a kind of standard thing. And then you will often have people uh, of discipline, I'm just going to call it index P. Uh, I'm not going to say what they are, but just call them P's. These P's might say, um, we know that that's not free will, that we, when we make a choice between a left and a right button, that's just random. That, that's not a kind of instantiation of a free choice. So, um, and um, uh, then you can say, well, well, why not? Well, there are several reasons. For example, one is, choices in limit experiments are relevant for the problem of free will because they involve seemingly random choices that don't involve motivation or reason. This is a typical argument from um, someone from the discipline P who would hold a theory that he calls reason responsiveness. That ultimately what relevant uh, for free will is that we just base our choices on motivation and reasoning. In this case it's arbitrary, so this is not a free choice. Yes, well, I'd like to counter to this that the case where we uh, seemingly arbitrarily decide is the most difficult to classify in the brain. In fact, if we have strong preferences and motives for one or the other option, we can classify incredibly well. For example, we did a study um, uh, seven years ago where people, car enthusiasts, that had very strong reasons why they preferred one or the other car, had to choose cars that they wanted to buy, this self-stated intention to buy. And with Antina, Anita Tusha was a PhD student at the time, and we could classify this incredibly well, an hour ahead of time, much higher accuracies. So when there is a motivation, it's not more difficult to classify, quite the contrary. It's very easy to classify when there is a motive and a reason why you want to do something. So there's that. But the other question is, 
Is this really intuitive? I've kind of entered this free will debate as a neuroscientist and psychologist, and often what I find in these debates are mere stipulations. The, the type of, um, we know that this is irrelevant for the problem of free will because the seemingly random choices don't involve motivation or reasoning. That's a mere stipulation. Why is this not free will? So let's just take some common sense here. What does the lay, both lay people, what does the common lay public think about these kind of decisions where you spontaneously decide between a left and a right button press? Do they think these are free decisions? Do they not think they're free decisions? And I had a, a PhD student, Robert Deutschlander. He was working on this together with a colleague of mine, Michael Powell, who's a philosopher. And we just looked at these kind of decisions from these Libet experiments, and we asked questions like, is this a situation where this person is deciding, is that a free choice or is it not a free choice? So they could rate the freedom that they ascribed to the choice that the person made or the, the action the person made. And what you can see here on the um, uh, x-axis, on the y-axis, is um, the rating of freedom. So when you're high up on this axis, it means that you think this is a very ch free choice. And when you're very low, um, it thinks you're, it's not a very free choice. And on the left is a real choice. You have two alternatives that are different. So uh, uh, on the right is a Buridan choice, which is something like on the left there's an apple, and on the right there's an apple. There's no difference. A real choice would be um, something where on the left there's an apple, on the right there's an orange. But now there's another factor in here, which is the fact whether this has a consequence or not. So we ask people, for example, to rate it a freedom, a freedom of a decision, but in the one case, someone is just trying out a pen or just randomly scribbling, versus in the other case, they're signing their employment contract. So if motivation and reasoning were what's relevant for freedom, people should say the situation where I've got a real choice and I'm signing an employment contract and I've got a reason to sign the employment contract, etc. That should be rated as maximally free. But lay people think that this is the least free situation. This is exactly opposite of what reason responsiveness from the PCAMP would, um, would predict. Quite the contrary, it seems that they believe that the situation where you're more or less randomly deciding is a situation that is particularly free. Um, so, of course, we can technically define freedom, like, uh, for example, we define work in physics, um, um, we might define this different than, uh, than, than lay terms. But whenever we have these um, uh, redefinitions, we have to be careful when we enter interdisciplinary debates that we don't kind of import some problems just because we have a very counterintuitive way of defining our concepts. Another typical conceptual critique of the Libet experiments is this one. You, I hear this all the time. Oh, well, we know that these decisions, when people make the choice on a trial for the left or right button, um, it's just random. And people actually decide when they decide to participate in the experiment. Hey, do you want to participate in the experiment? Let me think. Do I have time to participate? Yes, I'm going to come along. I'm going to participate in your experiment. There you go. That's the decision. When you go to the experiment itself, oh, I'm just randomly pressing buttons. I'm just kind of more or less um, uh, uh, um, uh, behaving completely randomly. So. Um, they would think they're too impoverished. In fact, it turns out that we can decode not only what's called intentions in action, so when you're deciding now, but we perfectly well can decode prospective intentions as well. So I, if, we, if we go several seconds back, say 20 or 30 seconds, we can decode from brain signals something that happens 20, 30 seconds later. There's no problem. We can decode the intentions also in this pr perspective condition. It doesn't really matter. Um, and another, even more important point is let's ask the lay people again. Do you think this argument is convincing? Um, and so we put people in a situation where you could make a, uh, it would, the, the lay people had to judge again these scenarios where someone was making a decision. And the one case someone might say, yeah, a day before my, uh, I had to put this into action, I decided I'm going to take whatever, the Coke. But when it came to it, I decided I'm going to take the Fanta. So the question is, you've got a prospective intention, something happens before, um, and then you've got another thing that happens while you're actually engaging with the intention. So what is more relevant? It turns out the people judge the prospective intention as completely irrelevant. The only thing that matters for your freedom is when you are acting. At 
this immediate instant before you start acting, what you wanted then. Anything that happens before is irrelevant for your freedom. So that's something that um, I think is also not a very good uh, criticism. Um, so I, I think these, a lot of these um, um, criticisms of the Libet experiments from the PCAMP are not very good criticisms. Um, what I want to show you is that there are good criticisms of the Libet experiments, and I don't think that you can use them to rule out free will. Um, but I'm going to show you what the real reason is why that doesn't work. First of all, I want to show you something else. So typically, when you look at the problem of free will, it's constrained to something that has to do with um, at the point in time when you make your choice, and your decision and your mind is kind of, um, uh, your brain state is completely determined and follows the causal laws of nature, that that is what constrains you. And that this might be a challenge to free will, and that we have to possibly redefine free will in a way that is compatible with determinism. That's a very common move in philosophy. Sorry, I mentioned it there. I mean P, of course, not philosophy. So, but actually, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So we actually use this uh, free will inventory because it gives you other uh, dimensions, not only free will, it gives you determination, determinism and dualism. And what turns out is it's completely uh, 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 crazy. People tend to think that their minds are separate from their brains. We are dualists. Most people, that's in the bottom right here, are in Singapore and the US, are dualists. We think that our mind is separate from our brain, and they don't have a problem with determinism when, for example, they come to a decision point and you say, well, the laws of nature are constraining your choice. They think, so what? My mind is separable. I have my little mind space where I can secretly make my decision. It's got nothing to do with my brain. And I, that's, what, that's why I have my freedom. It's got nothing to do with complicated actions of redefining free will and then making them compatible with determinism. Their, their move is much simpler. They are not constrained by determinism because it's about their mind. And we're going to, later on, we're going to come to this, um, to this issue. So, um, what is the basis of these brain signals? And now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to try and take down the Libet experiments and these choice prediction experiments. So, including the experiments that we've published, and based on trying to explain what they really show and what they don't show. So, how can this come about? How do we get this choice predictive information? The information seven seconds before people think they're making up their mind. Well, one interpretation is it's deterministic. You'd say that by the time the brain signal starts, seven seconds before your choice, think of this like a sequence of domino stones. Yeah. You topple over the first domino stone, and there is a completely deterministic process that ends up in kind of a series of events happening, all the domino stones toppling over, and then the last one toppling over, that's when you've made your decision and you start your action. That's a deterministic model, that the decision is fully finalized by these early brain signals. Why can't we predict perfectly in this interpretation? We can't predict perfectly because our scanners suck. They're great, they're the best way we have to measure brain activity non-invasively, but still we don't get at brain signals with a level of detail that we would really like. So the noise is in the measurement. Actually, if we could get at the brain signals in the frontal polar cortex, we could possibly predict perfectly. That's the idea, that's a deterministic interpretation. I'm not saying I believe this interpretation, I'm just saying that's one possible interpretation. The other one is a probabilistic interpretation. That is, the decision is only biased by these early brain signals. So in principle, only a partial prediction might be possible. We don't know which of these two is correct. Because we don't have the ability to measure independently 100 million neurons in frontal polar cortex. We can't do that. There is no technique available, not even invasively, that we could measure the state of all these neurons. Not even if we were to discard all ethical principles, which of course we wouldn't do, is there a way to measure the activation state of all these individual neurons. And there's actually, in fact, another interpretation of this. So let's just say, let's just think about a model how people make up their mind in these cases. So one interpretation is, you got your chain of dominoes. So you start the causal process, 
and you've got the domino stones all toppling over, and at some point at the end of this, you make up your mind. Another possibility is that you actually make up your mind when you think you're making up your mind. That is exactly at the time when you think, now I'm making up my mind, that's when the decision is made. And now, why would you be able to predict ahead of time? Well, there is a property of brain signals, it's called autocorrelation, and that might give you something that looks like a prediction, but it's actually not a proper prediction. So, how would this work? Let's say we base our decision to choose the left or right based on the signal of a single neuron in your prefrontal cortex. I'm going to open the box now, we're going to look in prefrontal cortex, on the x-axis, you have time. On the y-axis, we have the activity of this neuron, the spike rate, hypothetical, of course. And we're going to say, when it's higher than this threshold, I'm going to choose left. And when it's lower than the threshold, I'm going to choose right. So let's say this is the signal. It's higher than the cutoff value. So I'm going to choose left. But how would it be possible to predict? Brain signals are temporally autocorrelated. It means if the brain signal is high now, there's a very good chance that it was high a millisecond before, and a millisecond before, and a millisecond before. So if we go back in time, the brain state will have evolved in time smoothly in most cases. There are cases, of course, where it's discontinuous, but in most cases it's smooth. And so we would have been able to predict the choice long time before, simply due to the autocorrelation of the signal. But the only thing that's causally relevant here is the fact that the brain is, this neuron, has a high state at the time of the decision. And if we could artificially create this activity state at this point in time, and the brain state would be below the cutoff in the times before, then we would still make the same choice. So it's only thing that's relevant here is what the brain state is when we make the decision. That's just one interpretation. We can't say at this point in time whether this or one of the other models is possible. But I'd like to point out something different. Let's go back to this event chain. So let's say we have this causal chain of events, and let's think about this in a different way. So let's say you have this early predictive brain signal. You topple over the first domino stone. That's the kind of onset of the early predictive signal. You have a sequence of events. They unfold in time. And you think this is a deterministic causal chain. But who tells us that we might not be able to terminate this chain of events? Yeah? We take out the domino stone. We stop the causal flow of events. Who says we can't do this? And I'm going to show you an experiment that addresses exactly this issue. So the way this works is similar to this uh, Dilbert comic here. So the guy on the left says, Dilbert says I'm predictable. Am I predictable? And the other guy says, Gesundheit in advance. And then the guy with the funny hair says, I must control my sneeze. I must not be predictable. He doesn't want to be predictable. He wants to evade prediction. And then his head blows up. And then the guy says, yesterday I drew a picture of what this would look like. So the idea is, can we be unpredictable? Can this help us answer this question? I'm going to explain why. Let's assume that it was true that this is a deterministic process that we can't control. It's also called a ballistic process, something that you start and you have no control over. Once the domino stones are toppling, you've got no way of changing this process. It's similar to a ballistic uh, process like with a, with a cannonball. When you shoot the cannonball, the cannonball is going to fly. You've got no way of influencing the flight path of the cannonball. So that's why it's called ballistic. So if that's the case, if you start the brain process and it's completely mechanistic and causally determined the way this runs through, all the way up to the decision, then it should be possible if I can detect the onset of this brain signal and I tell you something like, please stop, don't move, then you would not be able to stop this process. You've got no control over this process anymore. Yeah? And the way we studied this was using what we call the dual game. The dual game is a, um, you remember a shootout scenario in a Western, so let's say you're the guy with the back here, and you want to draw and shoot the other guy, then you win. And the other guy, he wants to shoot you. Now, let's just imagine that if this other guy had access to your EEG, or your FMI signal, and he could see seven seconds ahead of time that you're about to pull your gun, 
this would give him a slightly unfair advantage. Yeah? He could say, like, okay, he's starting to move. Now I'm going to pull my gun, I'm going to shoot first. Yeah? So that's the duel scenario. And the question is, similar to this duel game, whether when you trigger this process, the decision starts and you get this process that's unfolding in time, and let's assume it was deterministic, then once we've seen the in onset of this and we tell you, please stop, you just can't stop. It just runs through, but there's nothing that you can do. It's a ballistic process, like the cannonball. You shoot it off, you can't do anything with the flight path until it's finally landed. And if that were the case, and you could say, well, the cannonball has just left the cannon, we've got no way of controlling it, we just know that at some point it's going to land. This is the same with these brain signals. If they've started, the domino chain just unfolds. We've got no way of stopping this process. If someone says, hey, this has started, please stop it. You, if this is a ballistic deterministic process, then you've got no way of changing. You've got no way of influencing this. And that's exactly what we're going to probe here. Uh, so the experiment goes like this. You have a button. And your challenge is to press this button while the light is green. And um, that's like the draw, yeah? The police pressing the button is equivalent to drawing your gun. And when you press the button while the light is green, so they were pressing the button with their foot, um, then you win a point, you win this duel. If you press the button and the light is red, you lose the trial. So you've lost, basically. The other guy is shot first. The red is he's shooting you, and you haven't managed to press the button first. So now we're going to do this. But let's just assume that we have access to the EG signal. Then, of course, what we can do is we can say, oh, the guy has decided to move because their brain signal is emerging. We're reading this out in real time with a brain classifier. And we say, oh, the redness potential started. Let's quickly turn the light red, and we're going to catch him out. So that's the way this experiment works. And we do this with um, EG and with a brain classifier. So the brain classifier is a, based on BCI technology. This is an experiment done in cooperation with uh, Benjamin Blankert from Technical University in Berlin and with Matthias schulze kraft and Daniel Biermann, who were the, um, the students working on the project. And we need to be able to read out the onset of this resonance potential very rapidly, within a fraction of a second. And then we can say, oh, the readiness potential has just started. Let's see if we s turn the light red, if people can still stop. And it turns out that they can to some degree. So what we find is, and this is now the readiness potential again, um, that there is a phase after the onset of the redness potential, so let's say we detect the redness potential just after this red vertical line here. We see, oh, it's there. The person is just about to decide to move. We detect the redness potential, and then we say, red light, stop, don't move. During this early phase, this is still revertible. They can change their mind. They can stop. They don't move. If we get their stop signal in there too late, people will move. This is similar to, for example, when you're playing table football or something that's very fast. You sometimes realize you make a movement, but you're just too late for everything. You can't control your movement at this very fast speed. So there is a phase where you've already kind of, you might say, told the motor system of your brain, please move now, and then you can't control it anymore. But that's really immediately before you move. In the period before that, you can change your mind. So it seems that this model is correct. The, the model, the, this domino stone idea, that the Libet experiment, this choice prediction, and the choice prediction in our experiments is deterministic, is simply wrong. That's the wrong interpretation of these experiments. They don't show causal determination. So, in that sense, we can just stop discussing the Libet experiments with respect to free will, because they don't show what we would need to show. They don't show this causal determination. So, what Instead, can neuroscience contribute to the problem of free will? I think neuroscience can do something different. I'm going to come back to this idea of dualism. So beginning with Descartes, in fact, you can all go all the way back to Plato and find evidence of dualistic ideas. People have frequently thought that the mind and the brain or the body are separate entities. And there's a little closet in your mind, secret, that is not visible in the brain, is something separable, that your mind is separable from your brain and that interacts with the brain, but you can make up your mind 
completely secretly without a brain scanner being able to find out. Now, that's these kind of questions are going to coming back to the initial um, statement I made. People ask these kind of questions. The human mind cannot simply be reduced to the brain. And I showed you this graph earlier on. Again, I'm going to be repeating this now. That people tend to believe that the mind is separable from the brain. They think it's something different. They think there is an independence of the mind from the brain. So the enterprise of brain science, if this was true, would be limited in principle. If the mind is separable from the brain, then it should not be possible to explain all of human psychology based on brain processes. There will be a fundamental limitation to the scope of neuroscience. And I think we don't have very good reasons to believe this is the case. First of all, we know that um, there is a very tight relationship between all the thoughts we have and corresponding brain processes. I know that this is uh, something that might spark a lot of debate, but I tend to think of the mind as something that is implemented in the brain as a carrier substance. So similar to the music being encoded on a, on a CD, the CD is the carrier of the music. And every different piece of music can be encoded in a specific pattern on the surface of the CD. Similarly, every thought we have is encoded in the spatial structure of the brain's activity. And one thought coincides with one type of brain activity, one pattern of brain activity, and another thought coincides with a different pattern of brain activity. And there are good reasons to believe that this doesn't just hold for this famous motor homunculus, so this is the map of the human body uh, movement uh, uh, across the cortex. We have the same thing for somatosensory, so for basically touch experiences, we also have a homunculus. But the link between our thoughts and the brain process um, that the mind encodes the details of our experiences is something that I think that is the key take-home message we can take from brain imaging, that our mental states, our thoughts, are encoded in brain activity, simply because we can read out what a person is thinking by measuring their brain activity. And I'm going to show you an extreme example here from colleagues from the US, uh, Nishimoto and Gallant, published in 2011. There's a kind of quite famous uh, video. Uh, what you can see on the left is a clip people were looking at in a brain scanner, and on the right is a reconstruction using mathematical models um, of what the classifier thinks or the reconstruction algorithm thinks based on the brain activity, what the person is currently seeing. So I, I think this is quite an incredible video. It's kind of uh, on the very optimistic side, you might say. Um, uh, but um, uh, it's quite amazing how much detail you can read out of the brain about a person's thoughts. Now, um, this doesn't just hold to the things we see, but also our intentions can be read out of brain activity using classification techniques. This is a study we did uh, over 10 years ago now, where we showed that intentions, so what you're planning to do, right now, is something that you can decode from brain activity as well. So it seems that the brain is the carrier of our thoughts, and that would mean that instead of arguing indirectly as a challenge to free will, in the sense that the brain signals determine uh, what you're going to do, we should think more about the fact that brain science showing that our mind is implemented in the brain, and for this reason, it follows the laws of nature that govern neural processes. So let me explain this slide here. The bottom row shows the neural processes, the brain processes, and the top is the mental processes. And I'm not saying these are separate things. They might just kind of div given in different ways of measuring. One thing I can do is I can measure your brain state. Another thing I can say, what are you planning to do? They're just kind of different ways of accessing uh, states of the brain. And what you can see in the middle is the brain correlate of your current intention and the mental state, which is, I think this is my intention right now. I'm planning to press the left button. And the conscious intention you have now is realized by your brain. Now, the Libet experiment tries to prove or disprove um, uh, uh, free will by going from the left. It looks at the precursors of the neural determinants of your choices and how they determine the subsequent brain processes. And I think this just doesn't work, as I said just now. This, this is incredible because we can't show this level of determination and, if anything, we can change our mind. 
I think what we need to show is something different, and brain science definitely supports that, that our conscious intentions are realized by brain processes, and that whatever causal or laws of nature hold for the brain will also hold for our mind. So in that sense, we are, with our intentions and our decisions, we're just as determined as our bodies are, and as airplanes are, and as hearts and livers are, etc. But because we're dualists, we constantly deny this fact. So I think that is something that brain science can contribute to the problem of free will, but definitely not by using these choice predictions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Now we have time for discussion. So uh, if you want to ask a question, feel free, even if it's just an illusion, feel free uh, to raise your hand and we'll try to deliver a microphone. And you may also ask questions in the Polish language because Professor has the headsets on, therefore he would understand. He will understand whatever you say in the Polish language because that will be translated into the English language by our interpreters. A wonderful lecture. Uh, my question is about the uh, the the fact that you or the scientist uh, sorry the, what what you implied in the in the lecture that uh, scientists are considering the actions as actions as deterministic and that this is the uh, kind of uh, argument for uh, self uh, for free will sorry uh, so. My, my question is uh, that if if we Im imply that uh, free will, uh, we, we, that that the determinism of our actions is uh, somehow a measure of our free will, uh, then isn't this right? Because uh, uh, I mean, why are the why are some scientists considering uh, the measure of free will? as an ability to make a decision of determinism, if we know that, as you uh, greatly showed in the lecture, that we can consciously stop the, this, this processes. So why, why, why don't we think of uh, free will as a, just uh, uh, the, the fact that we have no control over the, uh, the processes that are arising in, in our brain? Uh, uh, sorry if that w question was confusing. So, so I'd say um, there, is a, there are habits in science and um, people interpret things in certain stereotypical ways. And if you find that one process is earlier than the other in the brain, people have a strong tendency to think that the first process has caused the second one. So there is a certain face validity to deliberate experiments. Uh, if I see something before my choice and uh, later on I make a decision, it seems that this is a very plausible candidate for a cause of my decision. It turns out that presumably even it is something that causally contributes to my decision, but it's just not deterministic in the sense I can't change my mind. So I think this, um, I'd say, more enlightened interpretation of the limit experiments still has to penetrate in the field where people will have to kind of stop going over the very very simplistic um, uh, interpretation of the limited experiments to something that um, uh, 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 takes a different line of argumentation. And I'd say, um, I wouldn't call it determinism, I, l I prefer the term laws of nature because in science proving determinism is more or less impossible because technically speaking you have to repeat the history of the universe get to the same point and say that at that same point you have exactly the same state that happens next which is i mean we can't repeat the history of the universe uh, but what we can say is we can describe lawful relationships in nature um, governing airplanes and computers and livers and hearts and also brains and despite the fact that the brains are a little bit more complicated than these other organs, 
Um, we similarly say if you take um, uh, climate science, you would say, well, I still believe, despite the fact that um, uh, weather, for example, is very hard to predict, I still think that the weather is governed by the physical laws of nature. It's just very complicated. And I'd say it's the same for the brain. It's very hard to predict, but I still think that the brain is governed by the basic laws of nature, and our mind is implemented in this, and that is a different approach to studying the problem. And I think most people are still stuck in the old way of thinking about the problem, and I think we have to take a different attack to this. And ultimately, the challenge, if you want to call it a challenge about free will or something else, it doesn't really matter. What matters is we think we can still choose otherwise at the point in time of the decision, and I think we don't realize that we're heavily constrained by the laws of nature. We have a question. Thank you, that was very interesting. Let's see if I can stumble through this question because it's uh, difficult. Uh, but um, like you said that we're stuck in this old way of thinking that we have a like dualistic, that we're dualistic creatures in a way. And uh, that, would you think it would be better if we got rid of this way of thinking? And I also wanted to say that like, <clears throat> whether we have free will or not, we kind of, we treat each other as if we have free will. So if we got rid of this, antiquated illusion of free will, how would that, what implications would that have for how we treat each other? Like, what would that look like? So, um, I believe in enlightenment, and um, there are these experiments that supposedly show that when you tell people that there is no free will, that then they behave badly. They have a higher probability that they're going to cheat. So you could say, well, let's just not tell people that there is no free will, in the sense that they believe there is. Um, let's just not tell them because they're going to behave badly. Well, I'd, I'd think that's similar to going back to the Renaissance or Enlightenment and saying, oh, let's not tell people about physics and, and the world and things like that. Let's just, they're behaving well because they believe in God and their belief in God gives them a moral system. And um, let's just not go through Enlightenment. Let's just forget all that. Let's just do something different. We've managed to um, maintain values by redefining them in a way that doesn't always have to make reference to, for example, divine entities. And I think it's the same here. I think, first of all, we should be interested in understanding the way in which we work, the nature of mankind or the nature of human decisions. We just want to understand that. And I think the normative side of this, what we should or shouldn't do, is something that's a secondary question because it's known as a normative fallacy, that we can't take empirical facts and deduce from them any kind of do's and don'ts, normative statements from empirical facts. So I'd say um, what we need to do is, we, if we want to evaluate choices that people make, um, say in interactive situations or in moral situations or in, um, when we have a moral debate, you shouldn't have done that, or even uh, in legal uh, uh, appreciation or evaluation. This aspect of responsibility that we assign to a person for their actions, I think is somewhat separable from the problem of free will. So, if you look at the free will debate carefully, what you'll see is a key reason, in my eyes, why a lot of philosophers want to save free will by making various redefinitions of free will, is because they want free will to be a basis for responsibility. And they think that if you rule out free will, there can't be responsibility. I think that's a bad move. And in fact, what we found in our um, questionnaires that we did with people, and now I'm talking about the intuitive side of things, not the kind of theoretical definitions of terms, but the intuitive side of things, asking lay people. Lay people have the impression that a lot of situations where something increases our responsibility decreases our freedom and vice versa. So this idea that freedom is a necessary condition for responsibility doesn't really seem to be what people intuitively believe. And I can give you a very clear example for that. If I give you two buttons and I say, it doesn't matter which one you press, you're not going to get anything. Uh, people would say that's a free decision. And um, in a situation where I then add a payoff to one of the buttons and I say, if you press the left button, you're not going to get anything. If you press the right button, you're going to get a million euros. 
Again, that's the situation where a reason responsiveness uh, philosopher or someone who believes that a decision based on motives and reasons should judge that as more free. In fact, people think these decisions are incredibly unfree. When you're faced with a payoff like that, people feel that they have to take the button that gives them a million euros. They can't act against that. So there are internal constraints uh, to our subjective freedom that um, uh, uh, are very important. But when you ask people so they'd say, no, you're not free in that situation, but you ask them, are you responsible? They say, yes, you are responsible because you're basing that on your reasons and motives. So I think the, we should divide free will and responsibility better. And we should say free will, I think, the lay definition of this and what most empirical scientists would follow is that this has to do with b the ability to do otherwise versus being constrained by your brain processes. The other is responsibility, basing your actions on your beliefs and desires and motives, etc. We should keep these two things separate. And then when we talk about responsibility and judging people's actions and <coughs> excuse me, trying to make people's actions better, then we should talk about responsibility and the factors that govern responsibility, and then we can talk about the brain implementation of these aspects. For example, are the brain regions that are involved in processing of motives, or are the brain regions involved in, uh, for example, emotional states or reward processing versus brain regions involved in ar argumentation and reasoning, are they involved in the causal kind of causally involved in the coming about of the decision, and that then a decision we might want to evaluate differently with respect to its responsibility. So I think we have to be very careful to make a dividing line here, and I would advocate using free will for the earlier case, for the kind of case of the kind of um, you could have done otherwise or not, versus the other case, the kind of a normative evaluation to use the term responsibility for that. And we're not get, we don't have to give up on that at all. And it's normative anyway. Uh, whatever empirically we find, the normative assessment doesn't, is not affected by that. So we can go and basically paint the world with normative paint and say, like, I think this is something they're responsible for and that and that. If you can divide it, devise it from some kind of moral belief system, then you can translate that into brain science. But that's a completely different enterprise from the problem of free will. Sorry, that was a long answer, but um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Sorry. Um. Oh, uh, you can, uh, it's not an important question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello, a very good research, by the way. Um, thank you for your speech. Uh, I'm doing similar research in a similar area, although in um, a different part. And I'm quite curious about certain things that I think that wasn't mentioned, or maybe it's not a part of this. So um, what I noticed in uh, your slides, it's uh, showing that uh, in your opinion, or at least what I see here, all of our thoughts are coming from the receptors that we have in our body, right? So there is nothing in this research that is saying that the thoughts might be coming from some other parts than only our receptors. Am I wrong? Please correct me. Because when you say receptors, do you mean sensory receptors? Yes, yes like uh, No, quite ICS. the contrary. In fact, the um, free choice experiments, where um, you can causally trace back um, this, or well, not causally, but you can work your way backwards, and the earliest signals you see of an upcoming decision are not in sensory regions at all. It's in frontal polar cortex and in parietal cortex. In fact, that's the idea of these non-reactive decisions, self-paced decisions. There's nothing in your environment triggering you to do one or the other thing. If I show you, um, uh, put in front of you, I put a, uh, a cup of tea and a cup of coffee, there's something that triggers the decision-making process. And if there's some kind of time constraint, I say, do you want one or the other? You might feel under time pressure to make your choice, and you're not going to wait until tomorrow to make that decision. Um, but the kind of decisions we're studying here in these self-based decisions are there is nothing in their environment that is triggering the decision. The onset is something from the endogenous process inside the brain that starts this. And um, we don't have a good way of understanding what exactly it is. But we do know that it's not triggered by an environmental event. At least to date, we don't see any kind of environmental trigger or systematic environmental trigger to this. Okay, yeah. so this was the first part, if I may. <laughs> uh, so. Um, you are saying that there is the moment where we can uh, choose to change our opinion, right? Uh, so we are triggered with this uh, bullet that is flying already, the, you know, the gun was shot, and then there is this uh, moment in this uh, mm, graph that you are showing where we are still able to change our decision. And I was also making the research on that, and uh, 
Um, it seems that, uh, as you're saying, that um, after you cross certain point, there is not possible to um, go back on certain physical reactions. But there are decisions that are more constrained, as you said, for example, uh, the choosing of a job. Right? It's uh, much more longer in the time. And let's say that um, it's a couple of months, and we are making our decisions up, and you know that can, it can be still changed. But. Uh, how much this is of uh, coming from the inside only, and how much is it constrained from the outside also? I'm using that as an example, just to um, bring up the intuition that there are many decisions we make up in a self-paced way, and often they are the decisions that we care about. Of course, um, uh, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the reality is complexer. Uh, uh, when it comes to decision making about real world um, uh, things, such as, for example, um, uh, which studies I'm going to do, which course I'm going to study. Because presumably, what you're going to do during this period is you're going to collect information, there's environmental events that kind of uh, contribute to this. So the internal and external processes will be very hard to dissect. Um, uh, so, but you could imagine a situation where you're kind of sitting on a chair in a dark room and you're thinking, am I going to do A or am I going to do B? And there's nothing in your environment that gives an additional input or trigger and you still take a while in your own time to make up your mind. And that's more the kind of situation we have here. In these more complex scenarios, it's very difficult to disentangle all these different factors. And also because we would never be able to, if you take a realistic scenario where a decision falls across half a year, it would be virtually impossible to track all the input to the system and it would be statistically, given the high dimensionality of all this input, it would be statistically impossible to assign any kind of causal processes here, I'd say, simply because um, you have so many possibilities that you couldn't possibly constrain this statistically. So I'd say um, I don't see us m kind of being able to track these kind of causal processes in very complex scenarios. Okay, then the last part, uh, if I may, uh, because in my work, what I do, I'm mostly concerned about the morality of this. So. Um, when I uh, kind of develop certain, um, uh, let's say, um, um, embedding of behaviors, because this is what I do, uh, I overcome the resistance of big groups of people and I work with uh, like uh, psychology of group. Um, and uh, um, the previous person that was asking a question kind of touched this. So we are now diving deep into the part where uh, we are influencing, right, or able to influence the human's behavior on the very early stage of them making the decision. So. Wouldn't this be an appropriate moment to also develop certain laws uh, you know, that are forbidding certain entities to mm, abuse this knowledge to actually you know, impact the big groups of people? Yeah, I mean, the topic of manipulation, whether this research changes the way in which we can manipulate people, is very important. Um, so first of all, you can say, if we can read out what a person thinks, does this change the way we can manipulate them? Um, let's just think about not the brain scanning technology today, but let's just say we, in 50 years or 100 years, we had a brain scanner and a decoding algorithm that would allow us to reconstruct in great detail what a person is thinking. This is just hypothetical right now. So of course this knowledge might help us manipulate the person, as any kind of knowledge about a person. If the person has a weak spot or has a certain guilty pleasure or something like that, we can, we can play to that and we can manipulate them in that way. So yes, in the sense that if I have access to your web page, for example, your Facebook page, I can get a lot of information that I can use to manipulate you as well. So that's in the sense of having more information about a person, making it easier for me to manipulate someone. I think at the moment, it's much more information you can extract from a Facebook page than you can extract from a brain scan, just to be very clear about that. The second, the second question is, um, what is um, how much information can I actually extract? And it, how the, what is the pragmatics of all this? I think we don't have to worry about brain scanners at the moment, because let's just say, take a simple example. I want to know where every one of you lives. Yeah? What I could do is I could put you in a brain scanner and it would take us three or four weeks and there'd be still a lot of uncertainty for us to find out where you live. It would be very, very difficult to do this. And there are ways of doing this, but it would be very difficult. But I could just ask you, and in most cases you're going to tell me the truth, and it's much easier to just ask you whether other than to put you in a brain scanner. So the pragmatics are not in favor of using a brain scanner. And in fact, there is a field that is, I'd say, um, suffering from this problem, and that's the field of neuromarketing, uh, 
where people use brain scanners to optimize products so that they trigger craving responses in the brain. Uh, so the idea is um, you can either show a person a product, here's my new car, what do you think, would you buy this car, do you think it's pretty, masculine, feminine, etc., etc. We could put a person in a brain scanner and look whether the so-called pleasure centers or reward centers of the brain are activated. The idea is if you activate these pleasure centers, then this gives you like a craving similar to craving for substances like cocaine, and you just can't help it, but you, you lose your control and you have to go out and buy the product. That's the idea. Honestly, this is just a pile of crap because it doesn't work. And uh, I'd say the studies that claim otherwise, I'd be very careful with these studies. Um, you can't make very good predictions from these brain responses about people's consumer choices. You're always much better with behavior, and I challenge anyone to prove otherwise. And I know there are papers out there that claim otherwise. I'd be very, very careful with these papers, uh, especially because people who publish these studies make money with neuromarketing. So they have, a, would say, a certain conflict of interest in publishing papers that say that you can do something with neuromarketing. So, um, uh, that's a question of the pragmatics again, and in these cases, it's, it's a catastrophic failure at the field of neuromarketing, I think. And I'd say it just shows that in most cases, in practical cases in day-to-day -day life, we're going to be much, much better with psychological techniques, with art questions, than we're going to be with brain scanners. The task of the brain imaging is to understand the mechanics of the brain processes that underlie the psychological processes. But the psychological approach will typically be much better to find out something about day-to-day -day behavior and preferences um, and decisions than it will be to, to scan something in a brain scanner. So I don't think that we're kind of challenged in terms of um, our freedom, in terms of manipulation, is, uh, is challenged in, in this way. And finally, I'd like to say, that when you talk about manipulation, you can say, well, when we think about the brain as a mechanistic system, it means we can suddenly intervene with the system much better. I don't think that from the brain scanning that we do, we can make strong predictions about how a brain is going to respond to certain scenarios. We can possibly say, well, I could stimulate that part of the brain, but just think about it. How are you going to manipulate a person by stimulating their brain? And it even turns out to be worse because if your thoughts are encoded in spatially very subtle and kind of microscopic patterns of brain activity, as they are, there's no technique available today that would allow you to, to stimulate the brain in this way. The mosaic of brain activity with which a thought is encoded in the brain is something we can't write into the brain. We, it, would, it would be even difficult to write into an animal brain in a case where you would ignore, in the thought experiment, we could ignore all the ethical aspects, just say, what could I possibly do to write a complex pattern of brain activity into an animal brain? That would already be very complicated. So I think um, that the brain scanning is the moment it's a basic research tool that allows us to get an idea about the basic mechanisms with which our psychological processes operate and to find out things, for example, that the brain is the carrier of our mind, that's already a really interesting finding, I think. Um, but I don't think we should expect too much in terms of pragmatic um, uh, information about how we could manipulate people from brain scanners. So yeah, thank you uh, for this great lecture. And uh, my question is about uh, predictability, because you talked about how um, even with invasive methods, we're still there's still a roof of how much we can <clears throat> measure, and you also have the butterfly effect, you have all this chaos. So I wondered if you believe that we could gain some predictive power by looking at not just the brain, but the body as a whole. So heart rate, gut-brain axis, and endocrine system, and if that could um, yeah, make us predict it more accurate in the future. So. The body is obviously very important. I mean, the body outside the brain is obviously very important. And it stands in connection, for example, just to take the example of hunger regulation with the leptin ghrelin axis. Um, this is something that regulates our hunger. But 
I think there's a confusion here between what, this is now very technical, between what you might refer to as proximal and distal causes of something. So I'll give you a different example. Look at evolution. If I want to explain how a brain works here and now, I don't need evolution. I need the state of the brain here and now. Just like when I want to understand a computer, I don't need to know who invented the personal computer. I just need to look at the structure of the computer here and now, and I can understand what the computer is going to do. It might be a bit complicated, but that's all I need in theory. So the history of the computer is just something that might help me structure my thoughts about the computer a bit better, but it's not necessary to predict what the computer is going to do. And I don't think that um, evolutionary history uh, uh, is going to add more causal things or more predictive power than an analysis of the state of the system right here and now. So that's that aspect. So if we transfer this to the mind and the body, I'd, you can make a similar argument. You can say, well, the way in which we decide is only determined by the brain proximally. That means when you make a decision, that's your brain making the decision. But your brain is influenced by the periphery of your body, just as it's influenced by incoming sensory stimuli. And they, of course, but the way in which they exert their effect is by changing a brain state. And if they change a brain state, they can have an effect on your decision, but they can't have a direct effect. So the body and external stimuli and evolutionary history, they're all called, you might call them distal causes. They're not immediately relevant for what you do, but they're something that has brought the current state of, of your brain about, and that's why they're causally relevant. But the actual decision itself and the way in which your thoughts are encoded, I think, is in the brain state at the point in time of your decision. I don't think the body can, has any kind of indirect route into this. And your hormone systems and your peripheral nervous system, all these things have an effect, of course, but they do have this effect by flowing causally into your brain and exerting an effect through the brain itself. And I know that there are people who believe otherwise, people who believe in embodiment. I think that's very confused, and I think it's about a confusion between distal and proximal causes. But uh, even in a time window of <coughs> seven seconds, like uh, the change of heart rate, which the is... The question is, what do I want to explain? If I want to explain what you're experiencing, your subjective experience when you're making your decision. That's your thought. Hey, I'm going to decide for the left button. That is something that is in your brain. And the body might have contributed to this, the periphery might have contributed to this, but at the point in time when you make up your mind, that's something that's happening in your brain. Mm. And of course these processes can unfold across time, but they exert their influence by going to the brain. So I don't think that across these seven seconds, there's something particularly interesting happening in your body, but you could make it happen. You could say, let's just say you're someone who suffers from heart palpitations. Every now and then, you sk or you skip a beat of your heart. You say, I'm going to decide when I have my next, my, my heart skips its next beat. So you wait until you skip a beat, and then you say, now I'm going to decide. Of course, then the heart has directly causally played a role because you've made it do that. So there are these cases where you could imagine that to be the role because you've decided to listen to this bodily process. But I don't think across this period of six or seven seconds that the rest of the body plays a particularly important role. Of course, there are enabling causes in the sense that they're unspecific. They don't say the fact that you have a, a blood supply to your brain uh, is of course necessary from your body. Uh, but it's not specific. The blood supply to your brain doesn't determine whether you choose left or right. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I've got a question. Do you know about situation from Liebert, uh, Liebert experiment that uh, someone intentionally didn't push the button? So actually my question is, does not making a choice is a choice from EEG or fMRI point of view? So could, could you just repeat that question? I'm not sure I fully understood it. So uh, do you know about the situation that someone didn't push the button in Libet experiment, but intentionally, so he decided not to make any action, actually. Oh, yes, so yes. was there any answer from oh, yeah. EEG? Li Libet has a version of his experiment that's called the veto experiment. And the basic idea is um, 
So let's just say I decide to move and I move my hands and I record when my body moves, I record when I made up my mind, I record the EG signal. That's a standard liberty experiment. So now you can say, well, please decide to move, but then every now and then when you decide to move, please decide not to move again. It's called a, like a, a, they kind of change their mind, you yeah? know? So, and what he finds is that readiness potentials are weaker. And uh, some colleagues have also done studies like this. I'd say there's a little bit of a challenge here, and the challenge is that when you tell a participant in an experiment, I want you to decide to move and then decide not to move, the consequence is that they don't move in this trial. And I don't know, but you might assume that the readiness potential might be weaker in these cases because they simply just don't decide in the first place. They just don't do anything. So there are trials where they do something and trials where they do nothing. I say it's kind of we have to be a little bit cautious with interpreting these experiments, yeah. And that will be our last question. Mm, thank you for your lecture. Once again, uh, about uh, manipulation. Uh, any kind, uh, when uh, someone uh, tries to reconstruct uh, thinking of uh, other person using either brain scans or Facebook scans, uh, anything. Uh, just generic, uh, how do you think, how, how do you feel uh, if uh, human uh, thinking and uh, free will is uh, at present uh, well enough protected by European laws? Thank you. If it's protected by European laws? Um, well, we have the data protection law, but um, so it's protected in terms of the sense that you would have to willingly allow people to use data that they obtain from your brain. Um, I, I, I'm kind of normally, I mean, this is a talk now with a stronger focus on free will. Okay. When I talk only about mind reading, that's a topic that I think is very important. But people don't realize that they give away a lot of collateral information. So let's just say you're a participant in a neuromarketing experiment. And you go to a company and they say, we're going to scan your brain, we're interested in optimizing our cars, making them prettier so people are going to buy them. And you think, yeah, yeah, I know your marketing doesn't really work very well. I don't care, I'm going to get 100 euros, I'm going to participate in the experiment. And then they do their brain scanning. So you're going to do some functional scans where you measure brain activity. You can do a structural scan so they know what is where in your brain, so the anatomy. And you think, yeah, that's, that's my experiment, and they can't get much out of that anyway. Well, yes and no, because if I have a brain structure of a person, it was called a T1 weighted MRI image, or MR image, then um, this can be used to infer all sorts of medical properties of the person. So we've done, uh, worked on automated disease classification, so trying to find out whether we can automatically, using machine learning techniques, predict whether someone has multiple sclerosis in the one case, Alzheimer's disease, eating disorder, so we looked at various uh, clinical diseases, whether we can detect these automatically from brain structure scans. And the answer is, you can do that quite well. Uh, by the way, footnote, much better than with genetics. Um, uh, so um, you're giving away a lot of information when you're giving someone uh, a brain scan. But you're giving them even more information when you're just clicking randomly on your likes on Facebook pages. So um, uh, we should kind of just be realistic here. And I think that um, it's important that um, when you give up um, a brain scan to a company, I mean, the very heavy data protection laws in academic university or clinical institutions, when you go to a company and they have your brain scan, I'd be a bit more careful because even if they wouldn't be allowed to analyze your brain scan with this medical interest, you never know if they might not do it anyway. So just be careful there. You know? I'm afraid we have no time for any more questions, so let's applaud Professor Heinz once again. Thanks. Thank you.